So welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. It's uh, it's a pleasure for me today to uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Camilla Schulz from uh, the University of Toronto uh, for the from the hospital uh, for sick kill sick children. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of background. Camilla uh, did her PhD, uh, did her actual. Let's start a little further back. She did her undergrad summa cum laude at Marymount College. Um, uh, and then did a master's in neuroscience uh, at New York University and a PhD in biomedical imaging at New York University under, under the uh, supervision of Dr. Daniel Turnbull, where she did uh, in vivo imaging of early mouse brain development. Uh, from there, she moved to the University of Toronto and the Hospital for Sick, Sick Children, where under the supervision of uh, Dr. Donald uh, Mabbott, she's been working on structural and functional um, uh, data from clinical trials in children, uh, and also in uh, preclinical studies in mouse models. And um, uh, Camilla is, uh, is here because she is a candidate for a faculty position and um, is going to tell us today a little bit about some of her work, some I think of a very exciting work on uh, imaging the development, the developing brain, growth, injury, and repair. So Camilla, welcome to, uh, to the Neuro. Thank you, <clears throat> Ted, for the introduction, and thank you all for coming. It is a real honor and pleasure to be here and share with you some of my work. So I became intimately familiar with the developing brain with the, through the work that I did at Sukit, studying children with brain tumors. Through these studies, I learned about the brain's vulnerability to damage, but I also learned about its resilience and opportunity it presents for repair when given the right tools and provided the right environment. So this is the perspective that I'm going to take on while telling you about the developing brain, growth, injury, and repair. So the children that we are seeing at Sick Kids that present themselves with brain tumors mostly come to us with the tumors of the cerebellum. These tumors are most commonly known by the name of medulloblastomas, and they're quite nasty entities. They're malignant, invasive, neuronal tumors of the posterior cranial fossa and they stem from granule cell neurons, which are one of the cell types in the cerebellum. The peak incidence of medulloblastomas is between two to seven years of age. So once the child is diagnosed with brain tumor, it is being treated with surgery, which is followed then with radio and chemotherapy that kills uh, highly proliferative cancerous cells. And this is really a testament to advances that we made in modern medicine, that in the past 20 to 30 years, survival rate of children with brain tumors increased from 20 to over 80%. So we are curing children of their brain tumors. However, the survival has come, as it turns out, at a considerable cost. So these children have problems at school. They have trouble finding meaningful employment they display a wide range of medical, neurocognitive issues and have overall decreased quality of life. Moreover, if we look at this plot which shows IQ versus time since diagnosis, we can see this sharp decline. So given this dire state of affairs, the question is what are the causes and how we can help these children. We now are uh, understand that the deficits that are experienced by children with brain tumors stem from acquired brain injury. And this acquired brain injury arises from two uh, sides. First of all, we are dealing with direct trauma on tissue from the tumor itself, which leads to white matter insult, hippocampal and cortical atrophy, and ultimately leads to disrupted brain function and cognitive impairment. However, the treatments that we are using to cure children of their brain tumors, such as cranial radiation therapy, are not without side effects. As a matter of fact, the side effects are quite significant and they include the death of immature neural precursor cells, 
impairment of growth of new neurons and glia, inflammation, as well as disruption of blood-brain barrier, which ultimately leads to disrupted brain function and cognitive impairment. So the deficits in the brain anatomy of children who were treated for their brain tumors are well documented. And what you are seeing here is a plot showing deficits in the hippocampus, which are particularly pronounced in the right hippocampus in this cohort, but also deficits in the white matter are very pronounced. We became to believe that the regions that are primarily hit with the radiation therapy are the regions that give rise to neural stem cells. So we know that radiation therapy kills highly proliferating cancerous cells, but in addition to killing cancerous cells, its collateral damage are neural precursor cells. And in the adult brain, we have two neural precursor cell niches, which include subventricular zone and dentate gyrus located in the hippocampus. Both of these niches were well characterized in animal models, and over here you are seeing subventricular zone giving rise to neurons that migrate toward the olfactory bulb. And in the dentate gyrus, new neurons are born that are integrating in the hippocampal formation. So given that we believe that the primary reason behind the cognitive deficits that are experienced by these children are deficits in neural stem cell niches, the question is how we can improve the health of this niche. Exciting data from our colleague at Circuits, Paul Franklin, showed that running increases neurogenesis. In their study, they placed mice in cages with access to running wheels. They housed the mice for 28 days, and then they evaluated markers of neurogenesis within the hippocampus. And what was quite remarkable was this increase in the doxycycline staining in the hippocampus of the mice that had access to running wheels. So in the context of this data, as well as another study which showed that voluntary running rescues adult hippocampal neurogenesis after irradiation, we became very much interested in answering the question whether these beneficial effects of exercise can be harnessed to reverse radiation-induced brain injury. So my postdoctoral supervisor, Don Mabot, put together a team of researchers, both at Sukits and other institutions, as well as experts in exercise and physiotherapy, and put together KidFit, an exercise program for children with brain tumors. 28 children participated in this program. They were primarily diagnosed with medulloblastoma. They were treated either with focal or craniospinal radiation, with or without, with or without chemotherapy, and their ages ranged from 6 to 17 years. The mean time from diagnosis was about 6 years. It was crossover design in which about a half of children participated in exercise training first, and another half of children participated uh, in exercise following a period of waiting. They were evaluated at three time points, at a baseline, 12 weeks later, and another 12 weeks later. So by evaluating children 12 weeks after completion of exercise program, we are able to evaluate carryover effects, meaning we are able to see whether any effects of physical exercise remain after cessation of the program. By looking 12 weeks prior to starting exercise program, we are able to take a look as to how brain changes with time. There were two training conditions to which children were assigned. They include group training condition, which was more intense. In this group, children participated in three group-based exercise sessions per week. Another condition was combined condition, where children participated in two group-based exercise sessions and two at-home sessions. So excitingly to us, what we found that after completion of the exercise program, as it can be seen over here, in children assigned to the more intense exercise group, we see this marked increase of the volume in the hippocampus as measured from anatomical images. 
We also noticed that these effects persisted 12 weeks after completion of exercise program. I also mentioned to you that children that were treated for brain tumors have deficits in white matter. And it was uh, very interesting for us to see, based on the diffusion imaging, improvement of white matter metrics in the form of increases in fractional anisotropy after completion of the training, as well as 12 weeks following the exercise program. So I showed you that exercise have beneficial effects for neuroanatomy, for the brain. So are there any benefits when it comes to cognitive performance? What we notice is reduction in time in the children who participated in exercise program on correct trials. And again, we saw significant carryover carry effects for this. So we focused initially on hippocampus and white matter because of the presence of neural precursor cells and oligodendrocyte precursor cells. But there is evidence dating back to 50s and 60s, even like studies of Marion Diamond uh, looking at environmental enrichment, that physical activity increases cortical thickness. So the question that we wanted to answer using the methodology that we are very familiar with is whether the physical exercise would also have an effect on the cortical thickness. And for that, we used CIVET, where we measured cortical thickness globally, as well as in a regional fashion. And indeed, we did see increases in the thickness of motor cortex, and these increases could be observed almost in uh, every case, in every participant. <coughs> we also noticed increases in the sensory motor cortex in the right postcentral gyrus, and again, these increases were present in almost every participant that participated in our program. So this uh, is very nicely illustrated now on a vertex-wise basis, where we see increases in the uh, motor and sensory motor cortex over here, more pronounced in right, but also some seen in the left as well. And what was interesting to us is that these increases in the cortical thickness were accompanied by small increases in white matter volume uh, in deformation uh, based, using deformation based morphometry. Uh, we noticed uh, this increase in the uh, area that underlies motor cortex, somatosensory cortex, and we also observed small, small area of increased cortical thickness in the parietal cortex. So based on this human study, I showed you that exercise improves white matter architecture, it fosters hippocampal growth, increases cortical thickness and white matter volume, and improves reaction time on cognitive tasks. But our human data is kind of messy, and the strongest eff effects of physical exercise we saw in children that were in the most intense exercise program. There is also added fact that children with brain tumors have variable brain morpho morphology due to the tumor itself, surgery. Uh, also there were questions whether the effects that we are seeing are due to exercise or whether it's the effect of social interaction in the group. So to answer this question, we moved to animal models where we actually worked with irradiated mice. And we placed these mice in the cages with access to running wheels, so we had more detailed controls, and we could also evaluate uh, multiple time points. And uh, ultimately, doing studies in mice will allow us to look at the molecular and cellular mechanism. So I told you we are using in our studies mice, despite some obvious differences between mouse and a human brain, like for example, the size. But if you look at the regions that are important for motor control, like for example cerebellum, a degree of homology can be seen and both are made out of multiple folia. So what was the design of our mouse study? So we uh, imaged mice four times using in vivo MRI at postnatal day 14, which is actually equivalent of a prepubescent uh, child. They were irradiated at postnatal day 16 and then imaged three times in vivo prior to placing in cages with access to running wheels 20 days later and 40 days later. 
It was two by two design where we had a number of control groups. We had sham irradiated sedentary controls. We had sham irradiated runners. We had irradiated sedentary mice and mice that were irradiated and had access to cages with running wheels. So for your uh, information, this is the setup that we use at the Mouse Imaging Center to image these mice. This is a Brooker system, 7 Tesla, equipped with four cryoprobe coils, which allow us to collect images in vivo of four mice at a time. We place mice in custom-made holders, which allow for anesthesia delivery, <coughs> monitoring of temperature and respiration. So using this system, we routinely now collect images in vivo of up to 60 micron isotropic resolution. We do this post manganese, co uh, inj manganese chloride injection, which is uh, a contrast agent that allows us to beautifully visualize brain anatomy. It differentially accumulates in the hippocampus, in the cerebellum, allowing us for visualization of uh, brain anatomy. We used two unweighted sequences at 75 micron isotropic resolution for the study, and we collected our data in about an hour. And we had about 10 to 11 mice per group. So what we found is that in this study, where we placed our irradiated mice in the cages with running wheels, we saw the strongest effects in the hippocampus, which is this area highlighted over here. So let's take a closer look what happens in the hippocampus in the four groups of mice that we were studying. What you are seeing here in blue are mice that were placed <coughs> in cages uh, without access to running wheels. They were sedentary. And in red are mice that had access to cages with running wheels. In triangle, there are mice that were irradiated. And in circle, the mice that never experienced uh, irradiation, they were sham irradiated. And what you are seeing over here is that the mice that were irradiated have this marked decline in volume of the neurogenic niche of the hippocampus of the dentate gyrus in comparison to never irradiated control. However, if you look at the mice that were placed in cages with access to running wheel, you see this remarkable recovery of the initial volume losses in the hippocampus. Moreover, if you keep housing mice in the cages with access to running wheels, 20 days later, the volume of the dentate gyrus is going to surpass the non-irradiated controls and match the volume of never irradiated runners. So that was quite remarkable. That's what's happening in the hippocampus. So we are interested what is happening in other parts of the brain. So we looked across the entire brain using atlas that allowed us to parcel the brain in different regions. And let me tell you what is happening um, in different parts of the brain. So let's focus first in the, on the hippocampal formation. Over here you have mice that were irradiated, but sedentary. Here you have runners that were never irradiated. And over here you have irradiated runners. And you can see that in the comparison to control, the irradiated runners no longer show deficits in the hippocampus. These deficits are completely recovered or even surpass the volume of controls. Moreover, the initially observed deficits due to irradiation in the number of regions over here, these are no longer present in the mice that were irradiated and had access to cages with running wheels. And some of you may be familiar with the uh, anecdotal evidence of anxiolytic effect of running experience by uh, runners. We could see in our running mice reduction of the volume of amygdala region responsible for fear control, which was quite interesting to us. And here is the same information in the image space, where you see as an effect size initial volume losses in the irradiated mice. And over here, you can see in the section that really the strongest rescue due to placing mice in the cages with running wheels was in the dentate gyrus, neurogenic region of the hippocampus. So to summarize the mouse study, I showed you that 20 days of voluntary running rescues many irradiation-induced volume deficits. I showed you that the rescue is the strongest in the hippocampus, Olfactory valves were not fully recovered. 
I showed to you also reduction of amygdala, fear-mediated region that was observed in non-irradiated runners. As you listen to this presentation, what emerges is a story of two brain regions. Brain regions that I think is, are particularly malleable, but also vulnerable, such as cerebellum, the primary side of the tumors that we are seeing in children with brain tumors, as well as hippocampus. So I have some evidence from my PhD studies showing as to why these two regions may be uh, so uh, plastic and that there is something really special about the process of development of these two regions. So the data that I'm going to use to show you was acquired in longitudinal fashion. It was acquired in mice that were um, delivered uh, manganese chloride through lactation. So simply lactating females were injected with manganese chloride solution, and the pups were feeding on the milk of the females uh, that contained manganese chloride. And as you're going to see on subsequent slides, the manganese got to the developing brains in sufficient al amounts to allow us for detailed uh, visualization of brain anatomy. And because during that period of time between postnatal day one and postnatal day 11, brain changes on a daily basis, we imaged two cohorts of mice to cover the entire period, both on um, even, on odd as well as even stages. And to give you a better idea, this is uh, the size of the postnatal one mouse. The system that we used at NYU to collect the data uh, looks as uh, follows. We have these custom folders. This is the quadrature coil that we are using to collect our data. And we also use sequences that allowed us to monitor respiration of the pup while imaging. So this is an example of the data from a single mouse that was collected using this approach. What you are seeing here is a meat sagittal section showing developing brain from uh, postnatal day three to postnatal day 11. And what you can notice based on this uh, movie, you can see that during this period of time, the entire brain grows, but the, period that, but the brain region that undergoes most dramatic changes in anatomy during that period of time is really the cerebellum. So, of course, our data is uh, three-dimensional. So okay, what I can do right now is to show you the 4D movie of brain development, 3D over time. So what you are seeing here is a back view of the brain with the cerebellum being at the center stage. And you can see the development of the cerebellar foliation as well as growth of regions involved in vestibular control such as flocculus, paraflocculus complex. So this type of analysis allows us to qualitatively evaluate the way how brain develops. But in addition to doing it qualitatively, we are, of course, interested in quantifying it. And for that, we use the formation-based approaches in which briefly we registered earlier stages to later stages. And through this registration process, we obtained quantitative images in the form of the formation fields from which we derived Jacobian determinant that allowed us to compute growth maps of brain across shorter periods of time. So what you are seeing here is a movie showing you change in the rate of growth of different brain regions. You can see that um, as the time progresses, slope of the cortex, uh, growth of the cortex slows down, and the cerebellum is still uh, developing quite significantly during these later periods of time. So this type of development describes an average pattern of development of the entire brain. So we were looking sort of at the population uh, pattern of the brain growth. Because this data was acquired in longitudinal fashion, meaning the same animal was imaged multiple times, we can now start looking at individual variability in the way the brain develops. So you can identify brain regions which are characterized by most idiosyncratic patterns of growth, the most variable patterns of growth. As for example, you can see in this exa over here, there, there can be quite uh, big differences from one mouse to another in the way the brain develops. So we 
analyze the growth patterns by modeling the data using either separate intercept or separate intercept and slope. And we identify the areas that are best modeled by using separate intercept and a slope. And lo and behold, the regions that are coming out from this analysis as most variable in the way they develop is the cerebellum and our hippocampus. So my hypothesis over here is what I'm showing you is a map of regions that are most susceptible to environmental epigenetic regulation. And therefore, it is no surprising that these regions come up in many neurodevelopmental disorders, like, for example, cerebellum in the case of brain tumors, as well as uh, hippocampus over here in the case of uh, its vulnerability to radiation damage. So the studies that we did in mice were done in wild-type mice that were irradiated. But we are very much interested in moving into mouse models of cerebellar tumors. So one of the models that have been used commonly in the field is math one cree uh, patch flox flox mouse in this model, we end up seeing, we've, uh, we end up seeing this tremendous overgrowth of the cerebellum, which does not really resemble the focal uh, tumor growth that we are seeing in children. So the lab of Alex Joyner, with which uh, I collaborated during my PhD work, recently created a mouse model in which patches mutated only in a subset of cells, specifically cells which express PTF1 alpha, pancreatic transcription factor one. By doing this, we end up seeing focal preneoplastic lesions that can be very nicely seen in this uh, enlarged uh, section that later develop into tumors. And what's really nice about our imaging approach using manganese, that we can visualize these preneoplastic lesions very nicely using manganese enhanced approach. And because we can visualize it, we can track the progression of these pre-neoplastic lesions into the full-blown tumor. So it would be very interesting for us to see how irradiation in this mouse model um, looks like and whether we can bring our model closer to uh, being uh, relevant for children with brain tumors. What also became apparent while studying this mouse model was the fact that we captured the differential behavior of these pre-neoplastic lesions. So you can see that initially they tend to look fairly similar, especially these two. But in some cases, these uh, pre-neoplastic lesions progress very quickly into full-blown tumors. In some cases, we call them slow progressors. But also, what we captured is a spontaneous regression of some of these lesions. So this, again, emphasizes uh, the need for longitudinal in vivo MRI study to be able to evaluate efficacy of different types of treatment. So what we are interested in um, using this data for is to do MR-guided dissection of these pleneoplastic regions that either regress or progress and do microRNA analysis that would allow us to identify the differences in gene expression, hopefully help us to identify targets for novel therapeutic interventions. So what I showed you through uh, this data in a summary is that in vivo imaging of early postnatal developing mouse brain and quantitative analysis of brain phenotypes in mouse models are possible. I showed you that cerebellum and hippocampus are most uh, vulnerable during early brain development. I also showed you that exercise improves white matter architecture. It fosters um, increases in cortical thickness hypocalpal growth and improves reaction time on cognitive task. And in a summary, it looks like promising intervention for children with brain tumors. And with that said, I would like to thank lab members, both from my former lab at NYU and my current lab. I apologize for these uh, issues with display. I transferred my uh, presentation on this computer, so I think that's the reason. But this is a lovely group of people 
which uh, was instrumental in helping with many of these studies. Our collaborators at SCKIDS and of course our therapists who delivered exercise program. I would like to thank founders of my postdoctoral fellowship, funding for our lab, and of course kiddies and the families who graciously participated in these studies. And I would like to thank for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Absolutely. So in terms of the volume increases, they can stem from many different regions. So you always have to understand them in the context of the model that you are studying, in the context of the condition. So in imaging, the increases in volume can stem, for example, from edema, and that's not good for you, right? We can also think about increases in interstitial uh, uh, space, which may be filling up with fluid. But you can have also increases in volume that are due to, to remodeling, to tissue remodeling, that stems from increases in the cells. The question is what kind of cells? The increases in volume can stem from remodeling of uh, the cells themselves, like for example, increases in dendritic branching. And uh, there can be also changes in the vasculature. So there are a lot of possibilities. And what's really nice, when working with the mouse model, we can now go back with tissue staining histology and use MR as a guidance as to where to look to understand what these volume increases really mean. Because using uh, traditional approaches, we are oftentimes limited to having a priori hypothesis as to where to look. MRI actually allows us to evaluate entire brain and generate this hypo hypothesis, but we have to go back and understand where, the, where these volume increases are coming from to really know whether they are good for you or not. In the case of the hippocampus, I think it's pretty clear based on the prior animal work which shows increases in neurogenesis in dentate gyrus in the particular. So that's what I expect as leading to these very strong volume increases that I was able to show in this data. Very interested in the, uh, the issue of uh, uh, variable Mm -hmm. Tested it with slightly, likely to be environmental slash heavy. Right. These animals are all in the same strain. Exactly. They experience the same environment mm. throughout their life. So, right. what would it be that could give rise right. to different right. Right. I mean, this is an excellent question. So uh, I think it is a testament to the sensitivity that we have with MRI that we have with the resolution, that we can really start um, identifying the subtle differences in the patterns of brain development. And even though these animals were treated exactly the same, there are individual differences. So the liters can be larger or smaller. Then can be differences in maternal care, which we know have significant impact in the gene expression in the hippocampus. And this is beautiful work of Michael Mini. So looking at the same strain of mice, but even looking at liter from liter, we can't really control the level of maternal care. Uh, also, the way the mice are handled, there is some variability in that. Um, the feeding behavior of the pups, we know that the delivery of the manganese I explained was through the milk. So females were injected with manganese chloride solution, the pups were feeding on the milk of the females that were injected with manganese chloride solution. Their feeding behavior could be different. The, the manganese intake could be slightly different. So all that potentially, even though small, it seems like in these two regions, it may play a role in terms of how they develop. So as I said, I think that those would be the regions that are most susceptible to environmental and hence epigenetic regulation, which remains to be looked further. So I'd like to follow up on the first question. Yes. I, I have a similar one, a slightly different. So, neurogenesis in the hippocampus is very confined. 
mm -hmm. only generate new such granular viewers go anywhere. Right. Yeah. Talked about this uh, increased volume in the water cortex in the sensory mode. Mm -hmm. And to me, I guess similar to what perhaps Alain was thinking, this is intriguing because I don't know how to explain it. Right. Because you wouldn't expect to have new cells in those regions mm -hmm. as a derivative of increased neurogenesis in the dentate gyrus and not even at some frequency. Right. So what is, what is the thinking behind Right. That? So obviously with MRI we're looking at the volume changes and that's what we are looking at. But seeing a volume change and understanding what is driving that volume change is definitely not going to be uniform across the entire brain. So I think our data illustrated very nicely, in particular in the dentate gyrus, that the increases in the volume were very strong and very confined to really this neurogenic niche, neurogenic niche of the hippocampus. But when we look with MRI and we look at the cortical thickness, what is happening over here? So it's not neurogenesis, I don't think so. I haven't looked with tissue staining, right? And obviously we can do it in children, we can do it in mice. But from prior work in mice that looked at mice or rats that were housed in cages with access to running wheels, we know that it's really the morphology of the neurons that would be driving the volume changes. We very much know that there is increase in dendritic branching, but there may be also some additional processes that people haven't thought about that could be driving the volume change. So obviously the, the tissue is very complex. There is a lot of happening in terms of like the supportive cells and astrocytes. Um, with exercise, uh, we're going to have a significant impact on our vascular system, cardiovascular system. Is the, are there new capillaries being formed in that part of the tissue which is highly active, like the motor cortex, sensory motor cortex, and maybe that is driving the volume changes more than increases in synaptics, synapses. We don't really know, and I think it would be really nice to do some elegant um, studies that could uh, shed more light as to what it is that we are seeing with MRI. And of course, um, using, uh, uh, looking at the pathways in these regions that are changing the most, that are being activated by MRI. So using MRI as a way to kind of like guide our further analysis that we are not blindly looking across the brain, but we are really focusing on the regions that are most responsive to exercise and finding out, can there be targets for therapeutic intervention? What are the pathways that exercise activates in this region? I think that's going to be a very important next step. So there's a lot of room for, for future, future work. I can ask that also related. First of all, I wanted to say I think it's really impressive the effects of exercise and to be able to correlate that between the humans and the, the mice I think is really powerful. And I'm not sure if there's an answer to this, but what do you think it is about exercise? I mean, there's obviously the issues of you know, metabolic effects mm -hmm. of exercise on, on mitochondria and, and different mediators. Right. versus circuitry. I mean, are you just stimulating a certain circuit in the brain that then right. leads to neurogenesis? Or, I mean, or how, right. how are you thinking about this? Right. Are there ways to, yes. to so, test this? Yes, so this is a very good question. And obviously, like, one of the key players in the benefits of physical exercise that was brought up is BDNF. So brain-derived neurotrophic factor that would stimulate remodeling of uh, dendritic branching and neural plasticity. So that's one of the um, ways that exercise could be exerting its beneficial effects. But of course, exercise is systemic. And there are things that are being released at the level of the brain. But we also know that there are things released, re released systemically at the level of the body that have ability to cross blood-brain barrier that can ultimately uh, influence brain function and brain structure. So to give you an example, heart releases in response to physical activity um, peptide that is known as ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide, that has an ability to cross blood-brain barrier and have been shown to be correlated with uh, reduction of uh, anxiety and also having effect on uh, brain um, anatomy. So I think there are going to be um, a lot of pathways that will be playing uh, in this whole process, but some of them may be more important than other. And I mean, to maybe like sidetrack from 
um, exercise and, and give an example even of more kind of targeted intervention, like for example, pharmacological intervention. So we right now have a study um, in uh, the lab where I'm doing my postdoctoral training in the lab of Don Mabot um, of metformin in long-term pediatric brain tumor survivors. So we are using metformin that have been shown by Frida Miller at Circuits to have a potential to stimulate neuronal differentiation of neural stem cells. And there is some evidence showing that it may be uh, beneficial for uh, children with uh, brain injuries, such as radiation-induced brain injury. And they've been thinking about metformin as uh, acting through uh, APKC CBP pathway when stimulating neural differentiation. But we know that it's not the only way that metformin can act from, and whether that's the primary way through which metformin exerts its beneficial effects, we don't know. We often are narrowly focused on one thing, but it turns out that it has multiple branches. So even with more targeted approaches, it's not a trivial thing to really point us down to one aspect or the other. So if there are no further questions, I want to thank Camilla for that. Thank talk. you. A reception right outside, so I, I would invite you all to join us for that. Thank you. Great, Thank that was you. fantastic. I was convinced to transfer my presentation on the computer, and I noticed, about it before, that some of the oh, lettering yeah. was distorted. I think we could still pretty much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 